Thanks everyone for joining me. It's another episode of the Travel Collective where I bring you exceptional tour guides, opportunities, and destination tips. So I'm excited to have a conversation with Virginia today. Thanks for joining me, Virginia. Thanks, April, for having me. So I've been asking everyone a little bit about what travel means to, because each of us for travel, travel can mean different things. Maybe we started as travelers, as kids, maybe we found travel later in life. So tell me a little bit of what travel means to you. I was one of those people who started traveling as a kid. My parents are both huge travelers. And so, and they didn't have a hesitation about bringing young kids with them where they went, which was fantastic for me. Yeah. Um, and so I, I have been addicted to traveling ever since I was little. And, um, and after I got, I, I was a German language and literature major in college. I, I spoke fluent German then, not so great now, but at that point I did. Um, and after I gradu graduated from college, that's what I wanted to do. I, I didn't have a job plan. I wanted to save money and go travel and, and just have a year of complete freedom traveling. And I think that's a big part of it for me is this like sense of freedom and freedom and exploration and meeting new people. And I just, it thrills me to the core, everything about it. And, and in those days also just even the process of getting somewhere by train or boat or plane or whatever it was. It's become a little bit more challenging, I think, in modern times. But um, in those days, I just loved everything about it. And um, and I did that. I worked, uh, I've only ever had one regular job in an office for about a year and a half. And it was with, with United Airlines. So I got free travel, which was amazing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so I did that for a year and a half and I went to New Zealand. That was the first time I'd been to New Zealand. And um, I took my parents with me and we had an amazing time, but I met all these people, mostly Europeans who were just traveling for, you know, a year or two years or three years, these big, long extended trips that people were doing. And that's kind of when I said to myself, all right, I, I, I'm not, I'm going to quit the job and I'm going to go home and save money and do that. And I, I did. And that was the beginning of not only just my life of traveling for work, but, you know, traveling for enjoyment over the years as well. So I, I came back from traveling for a year. I, I was mostly in Europe by myself. I had friends come visit oh, wow. with me occasionally. And I met people and changed my plans accordingly, kind of as you do. Yeah. As flexible at time. And um, and then I came home and I got a job working as a tour guide for back roads, uh, doing bicycle tours. Oh wow! And, and that's that was my beginning of my my working as a tour guide and working for, and traveling together. But what a dream job! And that's I think yeah. now there's so many opportunities to incorporate travel into a career, into a lifetime. I think that's the yeah. beautiful thing. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I didn't, at that point, it never even occurred to me that you could make a living doing something like that. But you're right now, it's something that's, you can, you can make a living, at, uh, you know, doing all kinds of different things with travel. So it's fantastic, I think. Yeah, it is. And I feel like when I was growing up in the Midwest, and it was pre-internet, we didn't, you just didn't have the opportunities as such because you had to know someone. You didn't have like this directory online where you can now go and find these yeah. opportunities. So unless someone in your community or work study or maybe through a university uh, study abroad or something. You mm -hmm. know, so I feel people, young people especially, are super blessed they can start traveling right away. Right. I agree. Yeah, that's fantastic. My daughter is a big traveler too, and she's graduating from college in May, and that's her plan. She's wow. saving money to go travel. So I feel very proud that I've passed that along to her. <laughs> oh yeah, I bet, yeah. And that, in that desire to go and explore because I think travel really connects us with other people. It shows us things we can't even expect or imagine. Mm-hmm, yeah. So tell us about New Zealand. It's a place I haven't been, and you mentioned that it was a be a place that you would repeat travel to. So yeah, tell me about New and, and I have repeated travel there multiple times. So I, I went initially with my parents for that month. We were there for a month. 
And um, I came back and, and then when I worked for Backroads, I worked there leading trips for a whole uh, season. And it was an amazing trip. It started in Blenheim at the tip of the South Island, the Northern tip of the South Island. And it was a two week trip. It was the longest backwards trip that existed at that point. And you had multiple days where you would stay two nights in one place so that you could walk on the glaciers or take a helicopter ride or um, go down to Milford Sound or you know different experiences that you could do along the way. So it was just this epic two week experience with this group of people. And um, I did that for about four months, my one of the winter seasons with Backroads, and then um, still hadn't had enough of New Zealand. And, um, and my husband and I then went back and did several of the big um, tramps down there. So we, so I've done kind of different experiences traveling with my parents and a little bit more of that type of travel guiding trips down there. And then when uh, my husband, John, and I went down, we did these tramps. So we would kind of go to different places and then backpack, you know, for up to a week oh, um, wow. and get into the back country. Interesting. So it was, it was completely different and it was fantastic. And, and New Zealand is really known for these tramps all over the country, Mult anywhere from, you know, two to three days to a week to 10 days, you can go out and be in the back country sometimes with huts, sometimes not. Um, they're fantastic. And that was the last time I was there. And that's been probably 20 years. And, and I would still go back to New Zealand again. I've, I've spent most of my time on the South Island and, and a little bit on the North Island, but I'd like to go back and kind of explore the North Island a little bit more. And I think what makes New Zealand so amazing is that it's this small country with not very many people and a tremendous variety of scenery. I mean, in one day you can be in mountains on the coast in tropical rainforest and then at a glacier, you know, it's oh my gosh. Wow. crazy combination of, of different ecosystems in a tiny amount of space. Right. And it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. And the people are friendly and um, the food is really good. The wine is really good. You know, there's really, I can't say anything. There's not a negative thing about New Zealand. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. And for someone right. that's not as much into, say, bicycling or um, hiking and backpacking, are there, is it a country or a place that you, you could road trip or rent a car and do it? Are there? Absolutely. Streets? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My parents, so they're in their mid to late eighties. They have been probably six or seven times Oh, and they are not into any of those things. They go down and now they've met lots of people down there because everyone is so friendly um, and they eat good food and they visit different towns and they, they do it all by, by car sightseeing by car. Um, so absolutely, it's a place that you could spend and not necessarily, you don't even need to be an outdoorsy kind of a person at all. Um, and one of the great things that they have in New Zealand, they call them homestays. Oh. So you go in, it's kind of, um, I guess it would be similar to what we have as an Airbnb now, but right. they, it's always in somebody's home or in somebody's farm. And they have homestay listings, so you can you don't even have to really plan it necessarily. You can get this information and book a homestay and and drive up to somebody's house and stay with them. Um, and that's how my parents met all these people. They became friendly with them, and they've come here. My parents have gone back and stayed with them. So it's just a really wonderful place for that kind of travel. Yeah, I love that homestay idea too, because then you're yeah. meeting locals, you get mm -hmm. exposed to things, they're going to show you or share with you things and places that you may not have found on your own, or like you said, the right. foods, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't even know what kind of food really is in New Zealand or native to. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of lamb. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it, I think it has, there's some statistic about New Zealand having more sheep than people in the population. Um, but now it's become cosmopolitan. So you can get just about anything, but yeah, they have more of a British kind okay. of food, I guess, historically lamb and potatoes and things like that. But 
um, and see a lot of seafood, obviously. Uh -huh. um, but they've moved past that. They're, they've gotten very sophisticated with food as well. Well, and they have all probably areas to grow just naturally. I mean, it sounds like a really lush environment in some cases mm -hmm. to grow things that would be yeah. perfect. And a great wine growing area also on the north, the northern part of the South Island. I don't know if you've heard of Marlborough. That's where they grow a lot of Sauvignon Blanc. So if you're into wine tasting and eating good food and wine tasting, that's a good place to go. Nice. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So talk to me about kayaking. When did you discover, you talked a little bit about bicycling and all the years mm -hmm. that you spent leading the bicycling tours, but I understand kayaking is yeah. now your current passion. Yes, well, our company, we started bicycling, hiking and kayaking tours. We, we've been um, in business, this is our 22nd year. Um, and so we started with all three of those. Um, the hiking was all up in Big Sur and biking kind of around San Luis Obispo county and up and down the coast of california um, and then kayaking was just a natural thing to do here it's um we have this amazing estuary here in morro bay and so it wasn't something we had a lot of experience with at that point um, but as time has gone on and we um we've gotten busier and grown and so forth um that's become really our favorite part of the business and i think um primarily because it's just so wildlife focused and people are there to see the wildlife and are really interested in the wildlife and you're on the bay and it's peaceful and beautiful um and so both of us love guiding these kayaking trips and um and we've also kind of started we have our daughters graduating from college so we're thinking about cutting back a little bit more on work so that we can travel more of course right um, and so we stopped doing biking trips about a year and a half ago, and we stopped doing hiking trips um, during COVID um, oh, because okay. we got so busy. Actually, we couldn't handle the business anymore. It was too busy. Wow. Uh, I know. <laughs> that's, I know. That's a we good problem, it. right? It was a very good problem. Yes. So, um, so now we just do kayaking, and it simplified our lives to a certain extent, and and opened up a little bit more time. But also, it's doing what we like to do best out of out of all of the activities around here. Yeah, the Central Coast is one of my favorite areas of California. I love spending time there. Um, yeah. Is kayaking something though that beginners can take up in that area? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I feel that it's a great idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's um, kayaking in Morro Bay, it's kayaking on an estuary. So it's really like paddling on a lake um, you're not dealing with any, you know, big waves or yeah. currents or anything like that. So it's a protected environment. And a lot of people think, oh, you know, I hear about sharks in Morro Bay and all that. Well, that doesn't happen inside the estuary either. So you get to see lots and lots of sea otters and harbor seals and tons of bird life, but no big, you know, no big sharks or anything like that in the bay. So for beginners, it's perfect. It's, it's a, leisurely pace and um, a calm environment to learn to paddle it and we do a, a whole lesson before we go out for every trip so in fact somebody just posted on TripAdvisor that it was a great trip for beginners I, I saw that headline oh so, good yes. yeah, yeah perfect well that area yeah. you're right inside the estuary does tend to yeah. be really really calm which is perfect because if you are someone that, like me that's a little skittish about being out there in the waves and not mm -hmm super comfortable yeah. with the ocean as such that's you're not in that part <laughs> right you get you get the wildlife from the ocean and that feel and the salt water and but without you know all of the, the things that you're talking about all the things that make it more challenging to right. be out there yeah exactly so talk to me about the central coast have you been there it sounds like a while then with your company yeah yeah my whole family is here actually so my parents are in Morro Bay and they were in Cambria, you know, 25 years ago before that. Um, but my husband's from the Midwest, like you are. And I, you know, talked him into coming back down here. We lived up in the Bay Area. And um, I, it's, we've been here since, coming here since I was about oh, probably 14 or 15. My parents bought a house here. And um, it's a place I have always loved coming home to. And 
it's it's peaceful and quiet here and it's you know like you were saying it's one of the my favorite places in the state and partially because it's been so undiscovered for so long that it's still pretty quiet um and I you know it's away from the hustle and bustle of of the bay area or of la and but close to I you know to either one right and get places easily um but I just love it here and kind of for the same one of the same reasons that we were talking about New Zealand, just the variety of scenery. You know, you can be in San Luis Obispo County and get out to the Carrizo Plains easily, which is a completely different environment, and up through Big Sur and into the mountains there around Big Sur and the coast and the dunes and the beaches. I mean, it's it's also got a nice combination of Northern and Southern California feel-wise, you know, and, and culturally, I think. Yeah, I think um, so too. Yeah, so I I love living here, and we've been here. We've lived here a little over twenty five years. Back back down here again. Nice, wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are some things that you feel? Because I am a bit concerned about that area. I see like um, the what I used to live in Santa Clarita in California, which the one twenty six then was a direct gateway to Ventura. Mm-hmm. There, you know, a lot of the orange groves that were there about 20 years ago are being just taken down and more housing put in. So I keep worrying about the encroachment from both sides of development. Um, Do you feel concerns about that? And how as concerned, I guess, those of us who want to protect these gems of places for their, you know, for the wildlife, for the scenery, for the landscapes, um, things we can do or your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think part of the benefit of this county having kind of been a sleeper for a while, you know, everyone would go to Monterey or Santa Barbara and people would drive through on the 101 through San Francisco and not really get a feel for things. I think the upside of that is that over that span of time, a lot as a lot of California has been developed and changed and so forth. People have started to appreciate places that aren't. And so a lot of the um, the land around here has been set aside through land conservancies, nature conservancies, through private people who are setting it aside intentionally. So it's benefited from being a little bit behind in that sense and that now it's ahead of the game when it's when it comes to protecting open space, protecting wildlife, um, and people here are very very conscientious of that. So I don't worry about it. It has changed here a bit. Um, like in San Luis Obispo, I feel the most change really and more. Um, it used to be pretty low key in downtown mm-hmm. slow, and it feels a little bit more like Santa Barbara downtown now, you know, fancy restaurants and right. fancy hotels. And so it's, it's kind of great for us to have that, to be able to go into town and have a really nice dinner out. Um, but it, it definitely has changed. A, a, the feel has changed more than the population or the this the um the building or the construction of yeah. new homes and so forth there is a little bit of that but not too much that's good to hear because i am you know you know with Hearst castle up there and you know i always mm-hmm. thought oh this is great all this chunk of land is still kind of protected pristine yeah because and that I'm- is that is protected still so that won't change at all up there Right. And if they continue to do areas, like you said, around Morro Bay and, you know, you know, Cambria, those areas too, it just, yeah, because you know, once it's gone, it's, it's gone. It's hard to like take it back, right. so to speak. Yeah, exactly. So what are some activities that besides the kayaking that you enjoy in the area? Um, let's see Well, my brother-in-law just came to visit. So it's one of the, was the perfect excuse to move on out of our, you know, usual things that we do. So we went wine tasting up in Paso, which is fantastic. You probably have done that. Um, And it's one of those things I just don't do very often because I don't know, it's always there and I don't think about it, but we went up for a day and up to Sensorio to the light show up there, which was great. Um, What else did we do? We went up to see the elephant seals north of San Simeon because it's the the time to do that right now. 
Um, we went into San Luis Obispo, which again, you know, it's like, you know, we're getting older and we think to ourselves, hey, do you want to go into town tonight? Or we'll just stay home and not right. do <laughs> like went in and had a whole evening in town, nice. which was great. We went wine tasting in the Edna Valley also, which is um, very different from Paso Robles as far as the varietals that you can drink in there and taste. Um, so those are those were a few of the things that we did around here. I'm trying to think what else. I like to do. I love to go out to see the wildflowers at this time of year in Criso Plains. Um, last year was epic, amazing, super bloom. And this year will probably be pretty darn close to that. Um, I would think so with the rains that California has had. And if it's, you know, if the rains were timed right, I, I agree. I think the wildflowers yeah. could be incredible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And just getting off on the back roads, you know, some of the areas yeah. outside of Santa Barbara, outside of, you know, yeah. well, even down to Montana de Oro, just south of yeah. Monroe Bay. Yeah, and that's where we live. We live a uh, half a mile from the entrance to Montana de Oro. So we're out there all the time. That's our kind of our backyard playground. Um, and my husband loves to fish. So he walks out, oh. out of the house and out to the beach out there in Montana de Oro and fishes off the beach. and hopefully comes home with dinner at yes, some point. <laughs> I was say, hopefully, yeah. Yeah. That's always really he does. Great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's a great, great place to live. I, I'd say the the one downside here on the Central Coast is it's very expensive to buy a house here. Oh yeah. And so, you know, we got lucky basically. We moved here twenty five plus years ago and it was not very expensive. Um so that's the challenge is to, you know, find a place that you can afford and then find a job that you can kind of, you know, afford to pay your mortgage with. Right. Exactly. That balance. Yeah. I know. Tell us a little bit again about your company then your current company. Um, yeah. So our company is called central coast outdoors. And um, like I said, we just do kayaking trips. Now there is a central coast kayaks down in Pismo and shell beach. Um, they do kayak tours as well. They do open ocean kayak tours down there off of Pismo. Um, but Central Coast Outdoors, we do kayak tours out of the state park in Morro Bay. So um, a lot of people camp at Morro Bay State Park yeah. campground right there by the marina. And that's right where we are, where there's a little restaurant called the Bayside Cafe right there. And we do a whole variety of kayak tours. We do a couple trips in the morning a shorter trip and and then a slightly longer trip to one's two, two and a half hours, one's three, three and a half. Um, and they're both the same on the water where we're, we're going out and looking for wildlife. Again, sea otters are oh, a big yeah. deal here. We have, we just had a count a few days ago and we had 46 adults and 10 pups. Nice. So we see a lot of sea otters out there. Um, and then the longer trip also goes across the bay to the sand spit and we'll get out there of the kayaks and walk on the dunes and go out to the ocean on the other side and do a little exploring there on the dunes. Um, we do sunset paddles where we serve wine and snacks out there on the dunes at sunset oh, and then paddle back at, at dusk. And then we do all kinds of really fun private tours as well, um, where we'll do a full, really nice kind of gourmet picnic lunch out there on the dunes, and we'll do a dinner trip on, on the dunes as well. So we have, I don't know, four, four is that about five different yeah. tours, with a lot of private tours as well. I think during COVID, what happened was, you know, everyone, we were busy because we were outside, um, yeah. but everyone wanted a private trip. And as soon as that started, we realized, you know, maybe we should do that anyway. And so we do a lot of private trips as well. That tends, I'd say that's about half of our business now actually is private tours. Right. Yeah, there was that shift during COVID, A, to get outside more, which was wonderful. Yeah. But B, um, from group trips with people you didn't know to these private excursions, which yeah. that's nice that you offer so many custom private experiences for people. What a nice add-on to an hour. Mm -hmm something memorable for people. Yeah, you know, we do a lot of birthdays and anniversaries and reunions of friends and corporate excursions and things like that, where they just want their group and they want it to be focused on something in particular. And, you know, we can, 
If you're on one of our regular trips, they're, they're wonderful as well. You'll be with other people most likely. Um, but we keep it small. We keep, we make it eight people take up to eight people with one guide. Mm -hmm. Um, so we don't, you're not with a massive group out there on the Bay. And then we, if we get more than eight people, then we split it up and we have a second guide out there. So, um, so it's always small, but you know, we have a little bit more flexibility on the private tours. Um, but they're, they're great no matter what. Oh yeah. Just to be out there on the water is, is super fun. Right. And January, I know there's like a birding festival that's held mm -hmm. annually in Mora Bay. That's probably a really nice time to be there. Yes. Like more birds are kind of there during that time at the estuary. Yeah. Yeah. The migratory season starts like in November for all these migratory birds coming in. And Mora Bay, last I heard, I think it's one of the top three oh. um, migratory bird and bird um, bird watching places in the U.S., and so that bird festival is every Martin Luther King weekend. Um, and John and I actually do all of their guided kayak tours. So if you you sign up for the bird festival and there are umpteen jillion yeah. different things that you can do with them. Um, and one of them is our kayak tour. We do usually 10 kayak tours over the course of their five days. And, and those trips are all about birds. You know, we, right. where you'll go out and hold your binoculars up and sit and watch a common loon for five minutes or something, Yeah, which we don't necessarily do on our regular trips. <laughs> yeah. People are like, okay, I know that's a bird over there and let's move on. Yeah. Let's go on. <laughs> yeah. Let's see what else right. is like. Here. But yeah, for bird watchers, I know it's amazing how, you know, they, they can recognize different species and, you know, they're just really keyed into that. And yeah. same with the elephant seals, the docents up there along mm -hmm. the beach, they're aware of, returning elephant seals and what they look like it's amazing to me yeah yeah it's really cool up there when that when things are going on which they are right now yeah yeah so how can people reach out to you if um, they'd like to connect and set up a trip virginia um they can check out our tours and there's a description of each one and you know what you see or what you might see and do and lots of pictures at uh, centralcoastoutdoors.com or they can call us 805-528-1080 and um, it's just so we have uh, several guides who work for us and and John and myself and um, but John and I are pretty much the only people who work in the office so we if you're going to call you're going to talk to one of us 99 times out of 100 um, unless we're off traveling or something in the winter time but um, yeah we'll happy to answer any questions about kayaking or we like to talk about the central coast also so we have all kinds of resources on the website also about different things to do here on the central coast and um, restaurants and hotels and things like that that we like wonderful thank you so much for sharing today virginia i very much appreciate it thank you april thanks for having me i appreciate it <laughs>